Okay, welcome everyone. If you take a seat, we'll soon begin. This is a very short, quick fire session where you can hear what is coming up next for our working groups, task forces, and initiatives. Is it loud enough? Yeah. Okay, so um, I think you've heard quite a lot about how to get involved in our technical groups this week. If you don't know, I'm kind of surprised, but I will tell you at the end. Um, and now you will also be reminded that these are our technical leads of those groups, so you can have your last chance to come and find them and talk to them in the remaining breaks. Um, we do a new work plan every strategy period, but we do a light touch revision every year. So also what you share with us this week will help with informing that revision, which will be starting in the next quarter. And you can find the work plan on the website. You just search for work plan and it will come up as well as past work plans. And you can then see what the different groups are doing and that can help you decide which groups to join. Okay, so we have a lot of speakers, so I'm going to, without any further ado, hand over to our first, Katie. Hi everybody, so on behalf of the Learning and Development Working Group, I've got a few quick updates. <coughs> the first is that we have developed a new CPHA training of trainers, um, so it's a five-day course and it covers a mixture of training skills and then introducing key alliance learning packages. Um, we've piloted the course recently and we're now looking for opportunities to do some regional training of trainers. So if anybody is interested in that, uh, please let us know. The next update is that we're working on, as some of you heard yesterday, a learning needs assessment on the intersectionality of climate crisis and child protection. So the online survey has now closed, that part is finished, but we're still conducting some focus groups and um, desk review of any existing learning materials or related research on, on this intersectionality. So if you know of any resources or have been doing any work on this, we would love to hear from you. Um, we're hoping to share a report in September, early September, with some recommendations on next steps for the Alliance on this subject. And then finally, we're trying to put together a webinar series. So we're looking for volunteers who want to bring a topic and work together with the L&D Working Group to put to put on a webinar so we will support you with the um the technology and the promotion and um on the day of the event but we'd really like people to bring topics uh from from your own work that you'd like to share more about so again please get in touch with us if that's something that sounds interesting to you thank you Thank you. So I'm Sandra. Um, I work with Plan International and I'm the co-lead of the CAFAC Task Force. And I'm going to tell you about what, what is next for us. So we have planned two global training of trainer on uh, one of our key resources, which is the CAFAC Program Development Toolkit. One will be in French in Dakar in October and the second one in English in Nairobi in uh, December. Um, then we have planned a dissemination strategy of all the resources that we have developed. So we have planned this dissemination at the global level with events like this one, but also at the national level, working with the CPOR, working with different partners, um, and at the organizational level. So if your organization is interested in knowing more about the CAFAG resources, uh, please come and find me. And lastly, um, we are planning to release soon, hopefully, fingers crossed, this has been on our work plan for some time, um, a key consideration on children associated with armed groups designated as terrorist organizations. So it's quite technical, but the idea is that within the CAFA group, there is like a subgroup of children or even more vulnerable because they're associated with these armed groups designated as terrorists. So this is like a short document, it's about 30 pages. And the idea is to provide some guidance on terminology, what is the terminology to avoid, um, the legal framework, and some prevention and reintegration strategies. Thank you, and we pass it to Martha. Thank you, my name is Martha. I work in Child Protection Case Management at UNICEF. I am not the Case Management Task Force. Sorry, I have to click. There we go. I am not the case management task force co-lead. It's led by Save the Children and Harass Network. 
but um, neither one of those um, colleagues could be here today, so I've been asked to step in. Um, so in terms of the case management task force, as you may know, a lot has been produced um, in the last decade. There are two big things we wanted to highlight in the what's next today. One is the update of the case management guidelines that were first developed in 2014. Um, we're completing the revision now together with the forms for case management that we like to use in humanitarian um, settings or we recommend in interagency in inter responses. Now, just I think to highlight for the case management guidelines, what's really important in the new ones is not only that we have managed to create links to the number of resources on other that other working groups are working on, but there's a strong system strengthening approach and lens included, and there is mention of cross border. And because those two things have come up, I wanted to highlight that. Equally for the forms, we've tried to make them a little bit more swift and easily adaptable. Um, and then um, the other big piece is monitoring and evaluation. So we're developing a monitoring evaluation toolkit. Save the Children is leading on this. Um, that will also have rollout. So trainings planned for um, East Africa, West Africa, Middle East and North Africa is my understanding. Um, and this will be the first framework looking at how do we actually capture data in a standard way globally in case management to really push on um, evidence and accountability. Over to you, Hannah. Good day, everybody. My name is Joanna Wedge. I work with International Rescue Committee as one of the co-leads of the Global Child Protection Minimum Standards Working Group here at the Alliance. And as I talk, you're going to see some images on the screen. Um, these are from a project that one of our working group members, Plan International, did with children and communities in Lake Chad, and also some images that uh, the working group uh, ha had as a project in Bangladesh where we asked communities and children about what do the CPMS look like, what do minimum standards um, seem like in your communities. So these are downloadable il illustrations along with the individual images from uh, a storybook that we had created in the Middle East with Kuras Network, one of our working group members at the time. Um, so if they interest you, please uh, look uh, for the CPMS page on the Alliance website. Now, as you all know, the minimum standards are about quality and accountability in our sector. And at the working group, we've been thinking about what does accountability mean for the minimum standards. So we have been pondering, of course, who are we accountable to? As members, we're accountable to donors, we're accountable where relevant to host government, to host communities. <laughs> We're accountable to each other as uh, organizations who are operating um, in humanitarian space on the protection of children. We want to be able to rely on each other and know what we are all reaching for, what we're trying to achieve in terms of protection for children. We now run an annual exercise at the Alliance where all members are encouraged to do an assessment, uh, a confidential assessment, about how you feel you're doing in the implementation of the minimum standards. So maybe you individually have been asked to do that before, in which case, thank you very much if you've uh, uh, completed that survey. Um, it's coming out again uh, this fall in September. So whether you'll be leading it for your organization or maybe someone within your organization asks you contribute to it, it is a way that we have to be accountable to ourselves uh, and then uh, when we uh, aggregate all the data then to our sector about how well we're implementing uh, the minimum standards. But also you noticed, I probably didn't mention accountability to affected people, in particular children. And this is something we're now trying to dig into a little bit at the working group level. So we are in the process Joanna. of developing a fun Joanna, set of tools. Do you want to move to the next oh. slide? A uh, fun set of tools. Um, for to use with children age 6 to 12 and also adolescents age 13 to 17 to hold us as child protection agencies and the alliance members accountable for reaching our minimum standards or reaching for our standards um, in our operations. So it's a big initiative, it's a bold initiative, we're in uncharted waters a little bit 
so if your country, uh, if your op country operation, if your organization is interested in piloting those tools, uh, probably October, September or October this year, then please reach out to the working group in the next week. We've had a lot of interest, but we are still going through that process of selecting pilot sites. Um, and if that's not something you're able to contribute to at the moment, then please look out for the resource, which we'll probably be sharing to start off uh, 2025. So. Amazing. Great. Thank you. And if you just land on the last slide, people can have a look at that one as you as you come off stage. Fabulous. OK, so we're going to we've got so much going on that we've got to do two back to back <laughs> rotations of our panelists. So I'll invite the next on stage in a moment. OK, yeah, great. OK, so. I'll click to your slide. Uh, oh, it was. OK, great. So my name is Yvonne Agengo. I work for the International Rescue Committee. And I'm representing my colleague, Sanjana, who co-leads together with Camila, the inclusive, sorry, accountability to children advisory group. Uh, she could not be with us here today. So accountability to children initiative, um, we know that almost all the organizations here, we have developed guidance on child participation and accountability, but we still find that uh, the evidence gap on accountability to children is, is, is huge. We have resources, tools, guidelines, but uh, the evidence on the topic is weak. So within this um, advisory group, we are going to be working with uh, youth-led organizations the initial idea was to work with child-led organizations to develop, um, uh, to generate the evidence on barriers and enablers of accountability to children. And we're really looking at non-protection sectors. So how to ensure accountability to children by all actors who interact with children in humanitarian uh, settings. Um, we have uh, understood already some of the barriers linked to uh, transferring funds to local organizations and it's even more difficult to youth-led and child-led organizations in terms of policies and procedures. And these are some of the barriers that we're already seeing are limiting our inclusion of uh, children and child-led organizations in defining what really uh, accountability should be. We're also working with our organizations for persons living with disabilities to ensure um, inclusion and accountability to adolescent girls with intellectual uh, disabilities. We know that when it comes to um, physical disabilities, we've made quite some advancement. But when it comes to adolescent girls and specifically on intellectual disabilities, we really are seeing uh, a gap and we're, not, we're finding it hard to even identify the girls in their communities. So together with organizations of um, persons with disabilities, we are working in Ethiopia and Burkina Faso as a pilot sites. So if you're working in these two contexts, we'd be really happy to engage with you and together build on the evidence, look at the barriers and enablers so that we can inform our work plan. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Stephanie Acker, and I am one of the co-leads for the Assessment, Measurement, and Evidence Working Group, um, known as AME Working Group for short, another acronym to add to your repertoire. And I want to tell you about two different projects that we are working on. Um, the first is a cost of an action study. Um, what this is, is trying to make an investment case for why preventing um, child harm in humanitarian contexts um, makes sense. To do that, um, this is a methodology that works to calculate the financial cost of not preventing child harm. So if a child is recruited into armed forces, what is the cost of that? Um, these studies are very complicated to do because we calculated on a number of different lines of what is the um, cost of their deteriorated mental health, of loss of family, of health issues. Um, so with PRM funding, what we are doing right now is to do a summary of what evidence exists on investment cases like this and to create a roadmap for how we could do this well. Um, the, obviously, we've talked a lot about data and evidence. Uh, it's limited in humanitarian context, which makes this all the more challenging. But that is something we are working on and will have um, done over the next few months. 
Um, the next is we're working on ethical guidance for participatory research uh, with children in humanitarian context. So we've talked a lot this week about participation um, in general and in the research world, participatory methods um, have become increasingly considered as the gold standard. Uh, but there's actually not tons of guidance on the ethics of that or how to make sure it's actually done well. Um, and we are kind of of a position that if you're gonna do it, we should only do it if we can do it um, that in a way that complies ethically and has really thought through this. So right now we are working to create a resource map. Um, there isn't actually comprehensive guidance um, on how this should look, but we have worked to compile and collate. Um, so if you were trying to do participatory research with children, you would have a place to go. Um, we are next from that gonna work to create case studies. So there's actually already been a lot of case studies that I've uh, noted here, but if you have a case study of how you've done participatory research, we would like to capture that because um, from that we'll work to build more formal guidance. That's all. Hi everyone, uh, so I'm Susanna Davis. I work with Save the Children and together with Sylvia and Elsbeth, I co-lead um, the Working Across Sectors Advisory Group. I know we've had lots of discussions and lots of sessions in the last few days exploring cross-sectoral collaboration, coordination, partnership for children's protection and well-being. And we just wanted to really quickly draw your attention to the fact that this advisory group exists. And if you would like to be in touch with us share some great examples. We've certainly pulled some from the presentations this week uh, of the work that you're doing, or if you'd like to actually join uh, the advisory group and be part of sort of shaping the strategic direction of the Alliance on this and part of like this really great space where we're learning from each other and kind of working collaboratively, you'd be really welcome to be in touch and you can see all the details on the slide. Hi everyone, my name is Sylvia and I support a global initiative uh, on child protection and food security to strengthen collaboration between child protection and food security actors. So I'm going to mention what's next on this area of work. Um, we are in the process of um, developing, finalizing a collection of handy tools that will support child protection and food security actors to integrate child protection and food security. Uh, what we have done so far, and you can see in the slide, we have um, started an interagency technical advisory group of child protection and food security experts. So we have um, experts from different agencies. We have collaboration with the food security cluster, uh, with the child protection AOR. There's others that I can see in the room that are also part of the technical advisory group. Uh, we have ECHO, World Vision, a few others that I can see in the room. Uh, we have done consultations at different levels. Um, and now we are in the process of finalizing, uh, so I want to mention that uh, watch the space. At the end of the year, it was the quarter three, quarter four, we will have the integrated programming framework, um, interagency endorsed uh, by the different child protection and food security experts and community. Um, so if you are interested uh, in being part, reviewing uh, in the finalization, uh, please get in touch with me. Uh, otherwise, will be ready available in different languages towards the end of the year. Um, and to uh, mention the focus that will be on for humanitarian settings, uh, focus on integration, and that will be uh, responding to the demands that we are been receiving by practitioners from different contexts. So really responding to things that we've been uh, asked to support. So for example, selection of possible questions to include in assessments or indicators or list of activities. So it will be really um, practical and handy tools for all practitioners on child protection and food security. That's uh, from my side, thank you. Amazing, would you mind just clicking to the last slide for me, Sylvia? So, what to say? I mean, <laughs> we've got so much going on. We had a panel of four yesterday of things we've just published, a panel of eight today for things we've got coming up. And I just want to, as we're amazingly 
finishing before time. I really thought we would go over, so you've all been so succinct. But I just thought it would be nice for us to take a minute to acknowledge the hard work that the Working Group Task Force Initiative leads do. They are often doing it with limited uh, level of effort or number of days per week attached to the group. Some are unfunded, so it's on top of their normal jobs. And it's a lot. It's a lot to just coordinate the group, let alone progress some of this technical work. Um, and now we're adding additional um, tasks to their list to try and be more region focused, more field informed. Um, so really a call out to you to appreciate them, but also to feed them so that, um, you know, that job of being field informed, that job of being region uh, specific is made easier because you're going to be the ones reaching out to them with your suggestions, with your gaps, with what you're seeing on the ground. And then I think another call out to you um, is to, you know, if you're seeing that what we're doing in these groups isn't uh, reflective of the needs you're seeing from this meeting um, and, you, and you're sort of thinking, wow, they're doing all that stuff, but they're not doing anything on this. Uh, we'd love to also hear from you about that because, we, as I said, we're revising the work plans, but also, um, uh, as Hani will mention later, we'll be looking at revising the, the whole strategy. So please do um, help us to be uh, relevant to your needs. And then, um, as I said at the beginning, I won't re-share um, all of the ways you can get in touch because we've shared that already a few times this week. But one thing we were reminded of by our colleague who couldn't be joining us today, uh, this week, unfortunately, Achen Kokonya, who's our member engagement focal point. She reminded us to ask you if you're not a member of the Alliance, please join. If you have a, a national or local partner who you think could benefit from being a member of the Alliance, please ask them to join. Um, so when you join, you can then become a member of our technical groups and you could potentially lead one of our technical groups as well. Okay, so without further ado, please give our leads a round of applause.